And on our Saturday panel today, I am joined by Malcolm O'Kelly, by Andy Dunn, and by Mike McCarthy. Mal and Mike are here with thanks to Volkswagen, official sponsor of Irish Rugby and Rugby Players Ireland. They have launched their Road to Rugby campaign, a new Volkswagen fan TV mobile unit will be at all the home games at the Aviva Stadium, giving Irish fans the chance to showcase their support. Check out volkswagen.ie forward slash rugby for all the exclusive videos. Andy Dunn is here representing Andy Dunn. <laughs> Go on, give the business a plug, so. Andy. Personal Self health rat mines. Personal health rat mines. Sorted out my knee. Go. Get it done. So, out half of note, Andy Dunn, how impressed were you with Johnny Sexton's drop goal? We are off your seat. It was, uh, well, I'll tell you where I was. I was listening to it on the radio, so I wasn't off my seat because the IRFU keep putting on all Ireland league games at the same time as Irish internationals, but that's another uh, issue. Um, so I didn't even get to see it, nor did half the club players in the country. Mm. But um, notwithstanding, I was... Go amazing. back to that now for a second, yeah. because... Like, so there's a full round <coughs> of All-Ireland League games well, at not, what time? OK, so half two, but you're you're talking about five divisions in the All-Ireland League, okay. ten teams, 20 players per team. You're talking about a 1,000 players in the country were asked to play uh, at around half two on Saturday. Uh, but there were probably nine of 11 weekends free prior to the start of the Six Nations. So if somebody in the IRFU could shed light on why they keep putting on games on on the same day as internationals, it would be... Uh, would be most welcome because there's, there's a lot of people pretty annoyed with it. You're trying to be annoyed but the plastic chicken yeah. that Mike McCarthy is holding yes, up for your yeah, head isn't, isn't helping matters. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, only, the only thing people are going to remember is, is the plastic <laughs> chicken. <I was> <laughs> are the games all the weekends of the Six Nations? Um, no, I think in three uh, three games there are. Last year there was a game on at the same time as a game in Aviva. Mm. Actually in Dublin at the same time. So, um, yeah. It'd be nice to hear why they're doing that. And have you asked the question? Yeah, I think there's questions have been asked um, at an official level to the IRFU by the club, certainly that I'm involved with all about here. If you, uh, if you were a conspiracy theorist, you'd probably say they're nearly being contemptuous towards the clubs, but I don't think that's the case. I, yeah, just, think yeah. I just think they don't care. So. <coughs> well, like the club game has enough care. issues yeah. without putting it on at a time when quite literally, understandably, nobody has any interest in it. Yeah. Yeah. Like mm. Your results don't even end up in the papers the next day. No, at all. No, there, there was were there any fans there? No, no, we were down in. Well, there was a few. There wouldn't be huge fans at the a huge turnout at the game. with family and friends, but it's it's a bit demoralising to to have to play and miss the international games when we didn't have to miss the game. You could have hung around in whatever part of the country mm. you were in and then come back it's, four hours later. It's, but it's like when you and I used to play for Connacht in two thousand and four, and it was literally one man and his dog. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Mm. Like it, it just doesn't make any sense. The no. people who are playing club rugby are the biggest rugby supporters Absolutely. in the country. Yeah. I mean, they're the... Like you should be getting two free tickets each or something. Yeah. You're entitled yeah. to buy two tickets. Well, yeah. Ma would have played in a, a probably at the probably the peak yeah. of the All-Ireland yeah. League when, you know, 20 internationals yeah. were on the field for, you know, 10 yeah. for either side. And sure. We played our final... Well, it, was, it, was, it was a final, but it was actually us against, uh, us against Lansdowne in the, fi in the final of the AL and there was 20,000 people at it, you know. Mm or the goods of it you know and we got up onto the podium of the old Lansdowne Road mm. and lifted the cup and sung sung some stupid songs with Trevor Brennan leading the, leading the way but yeah uh, that was 2001 2000, 2001 season that was the last one yeah uh, but prior to that then Brent Pope in his day yeah there was would have been in, yeah. and that was just a league match now it wasn't a final um, it was a league match it was 17,000 people in Lansdowne Road we had to move it from Mary's against Young Munster it was the last league match of the year but it happened to be Young Munster happened to be on top Mary's were second so it was a Mary's home match they moved it to Lansdowne Road 17,000 people everybody down from Limerick um I think, but I think it was uh, who was it? Bus Aaron or the uh, Erin Road Aaron were Young Munster sponsors, so that all the trains were for nothing. As long as they had Young Munster jersey on, uh, down to down to uh, Lansdowne Road, it was a cracking match. It was a ball boy. It was a cracking match. Got to see Popey hit Brosnan from like smash him right in the jaw from about one meter. It was classic. <laughs> I don't know if I remember the classic. He, Brosnan, like the first uh, die, first die. No, he was, he was gone. Brosnan was gone, Puppy was sent off, uh, so they had to. Mary's had to play with fourteen men for the rest of the game, 
Um, there was one try in it. Nicky Barry chased this guy all the way down, and for the it was literally shoulder to shoulder, but refused to tackle him the whole way down. He scored a try, and it was the difference. Police, police has scored defence. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we're never, we're, we're, we're never going to get back to those days. The way no. the professional game yeah. has changed, but even still. To yeah. be putting on games the same day as international is that yeah. putting off players playing yes. Ariel? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean who most of the players there's probably a large portion of that one thousand players I mentioned, and then you've at least five to ten support staff who are volunteers who would have considered even travelling to Paris to support Ireland. So it's cutting our nose off mm. despite our face, you know. It doesn't make any sense on any level. Yeah, I think we might come back to this and yeah. we might do a Saturday panel all around the AIL and, w- and where it's going. The academy structure within, well, within all the provinces, but particularly within Leinster, and we spend so much time raving about it. How's that impacting on the a- AIL? Well, I think you, you've got, actually in the AIL now, you're, you've got <coughs> the senior clubs have fallen between stools, really. You've got professional clubs who've got an academy environment and you don't see a lot of your academy players they dip in and out and you, you are going to pick them when they come back they're academy players but they're not really part of the fabric of your club side as the season goes on the junior clubs now are actually getting um, a community a sense of involvement within I was down in Ashburn Rugby Club last Friday doing doing um, a lunch down there um, the sense of community they have in, in terms of everyone who's living locally getting involved in a club bringing young players up from minis and then seeing a guy from four or five years old coming out for their senior team and playing in a Towns Cup or they won a they won another um, a, I can't remember the name but a, a different uh, competition only two weeks ago There's a that's what club rugby is about the senior clubs are really grappling between can we pick a guy who dips in and out from the academy can we hold on to a guy if he wants to play in the professional game and then you've got the older more retired guys who um, probably dealing with situations like I don't really want to play an All Ireland League game that they are and they're playing France and they they're it's just done that, done it. Yeah. I think it is hugely frustrating because I'm helping out with uh, booking is so I go up on a Thursday help out with the lineouts and you know we're finding you know Connor aren't releasing re- releasing many players so you know there's some guys who haven't really played for Connor all season and then they're not getting released to us to get game time so. Yeah, it's, it's huge. So what are those players doing? What sort of game time? Well, are they I, think, I think I think they get I think they're getting the game time from the uh, BNI Cup, which is that they're actually stopping the BNI Cup next season. So you know, hopefully there'll be It'll more more players. Uh, a bit it will. Players the available. BNI Cup is a waste waste of time. Yeah. Mm. The, I, I think the Leinster and, and Munster teams are are winning very comfortably mm. nowadays. Yeah, and I don't I don't know if the players themselves get any great value out of going to play the coaches not learning a lot from what they're seeing they'd learn more from a competitive All-Ireland League than Mm. 74 nil against Mosley yeah yeah, right I think yeah just that sense of community you're talking about them at Ashburn and and maybe giving the IRFU side of it then with the AIL games the day of internationals is there not the possibility for clubs to build a day around this so you go to the ground you watch you support your AIL team at half two and then the game the internationals at five o'clock and everyone stays around in the clubhouse and you have a barbecue and you get a it, it becomes a destination for people on the day of the game because remember like only 50,000 can go to a game for an away game you're probably looking at, mm. at two three thousand I think if yeah. that was the case yeah it could be well, they do do that some of the clubs do do that they, they will certainly they would have they would have a collection of tickets that they might do dinners with mm. and, and then they would have they would bus guys to mm. to lands that to Viva and whatever you know so they, but I, I yeah and I think they, and so many away matches they do do something but they don't re- it's it's very it's very small mm. I don't think they do any yeah big things. bar lands down it's a nice covers. idea it's actually not yeah. a bad idea but well, it's a business uh, opportunity there, there you go. yeah market it well yeah uh, we've gone off on a slight tangent from yes. where you were then uh, stuck listening to the radio for yeah. John having watched it back then yeah like technically how so difficult were you listening to me and Nathan yeah yes yeah. were you I was absolutely well, did, of course did, I was did you <laughs> could you imagine yourself not there yeah. well yeah I mean I, I didn't actually anticipate or, or didn't realise rather um, the conditions were as, as tricky as they were so to, to just as an isolated piece of scale 42 metres mm. if you take everything away from it it's still a pretty tremendous thing to do as a, a drop goal from 42 metres in the rain um, but I think to me I haven't watched it back the most impressive thing uh, it's, it's a double edged sword really was the fact he did the cross kick for Earls he had the bravery and he had the insight to do that um, which how risky was that? 
it, w- it was well it w- he's very good at that execute, executing the kick pass but it's the fact he chose to do something off off the off the kind of plan and script yeah. that ultimately broke the French down that's my but concern but there was no was way of giving that Earls was going to catch that kick no. either no you, you could know. see you could see him screaming for it so yeah but it, it actually started with the the dropout 22 dropout which mm pinpoint accuracy which Henderson caught and the you know the other interesting thing is when when France missed the kick you saw the reaction of, of sex and I think I think probably eight ni- 80 90 percent of players would probably th- give up a ghost think the game's over but you know sex though cool calm collected caught the ball ran back to the 22 pinpoint dropout which Henderson did really well to catch then the kick pass as you said to, to Earls which was you know pheno- phenomenal take and then you know 41 phases in I, I was there so I could see the conditions the ball was there's some intricacy there slippery. as well like he was passing back inside and mm. you know most people were just just holding on to the ball and taking it up where he was he was the playmaker in that whole 40, 40 yeah. phases like he was passing back inside passing it uh, outside of him as well and, uh, and everyone else just trucking it up you know it was like construction he was constructing we were going out of position away from good drop goal territory he'd bring us back closer yeah. and then hope that we the forwards who were carrying it up could make enough ground but he 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 varied from side to side in order to try and optimize his position which so is he, he was sort of sprinkling the genius throughout the 41 phases but the rest of the construction is is that something that has I come from three four years working under joe schmidt the constantly hearing about doing the basics about simple pass routines simple work inside the breakdown that actually in a moment like that where you're not looking for anything out of this world from a cj standard you're looking for somebody to get their head down mm-hmm. get a small line break win two or three yards here and a no mistake game plan yeah i, th- I think it comes on the back of that game in 2013 mm. when ireland lost to the all blacks um, you just do a session at the end yeah, of the session? Yeah, that's it. So Joe worked out that the All Blacks kept, so we were winning, I think the clock was up, and the All Blacks kept the ball for four and a half minutes. So ever since then, Joe does a drill normally at the end of training on a Tuesday. Um, and you actually work harder for four and a half minutes than you would in a game. So guys become accustomed to, you know, working at that level, uh, working at that level of fatigue. And, you know, it's all about keeping the skill level high. So th- I think Ireland have done that since since then. And, you know, it's, it's clearly it's clearly worked for them, keeping the ball for 41 phases. I'm not sure what the time the time was they had the ball. But, uh, you know, to, especially in those conditions, to, we know how slippy it was to... You know, to, it starts with the carry, the placement of the ball, and you know the guys do, doing their job effectively at the breakdown. So, yeah, it was amazing. What sort of impact does a phase of play like that, a moment like that, have on a group over the next 18, 24 months heading towards the World Cup in terms of the trust they now have in themselves? That no matter what sort of situation you're in, you can always go back to this and think. Well, we were down and out. We were dead in Paris, and we came back. And also, we now know we've an out half who can kick drop goals from really any distance. Which I'm sure Sexton always had it in his locker. But you always sense with Munster when O'Gara was at his best that they knew if they got into position, he'd be ready. He would want that moment. Whereas a lot of out halves don't. Like Sexton's yeah. now in that territory. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I watched. I watched recently. We watched uh, in the last while. I've been watching Finn Russell and Glasgow and Scotland. And, uh, one particular case where Glasgow were attacking, 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 um, and it's so many opportunities to knock that drop goal mm-hmm. over. But he, he was didn't hiding. take it. He didn't take it. He didn't it take it. Was it was a, a European game against the European Monster. game. That's the one. Yeah, and he completely bottled mm. it. It was just, there. Yeah. It was there. It was there. It was there, and then it was gone. You know, and like I remember, remember doing the doing the game with you, Nathan, and I can I can remember saying, "Geez, we're into drop goal territory." And then expected like another ten phases or whatever to kind of move them, yeah. but the minute he was, he felt he was he was close. He took the chance and knocked it over. And yeah, this is obviously going to be massive for them, you know, uh, going forward. I think you know, I think this it just makes their campaign, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's actually a possibility now. I think you know, with something like that behind them. It's huge. Uh, What's well, the possibility to Grand Slam or Grand Slam? Yeah, yeah. But I, I think it was so important to get that first win, no matter how it came. I mean, you know, like the reading harder up the, win, the, the harder win, you're not going to get. Yeah, I mean, the you performance know? wasn't great until the last, you know, 41 phases. Mm. But you saw last year we were slow out the blocks against Scotland, lost the game, and then we beat England, stopped them getting their Grand Slam. So you know, you see how important it is to win your first game. So it's it's and it's going to give the guys huge amount of confidence. Um, you know, on back of being the the All Blacks in Chicago, it's uh, 
uh, it's it's great for them going towards uh, the next World Cup because I know you know when the chips are down and they're you know they're struggling they they, they can pull it out of the bag. CJ Sander described it earlier in the week as going to a deep dark place during those forty one phases, mm-hmm. but also said interestingly that you know it's something we've been there before we've done that in training. Is that going back to that passage of play against the All Blacks? That yeah. like is it literally finding out a way to operate? With absolutely no energy, with absolutely no great brain pattern, just that it's. Yeah, I think I think CJ Stander was saying, you know, they, they kept the ball for the first seven or eight phases, and he was kind of questioning his head how 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 much he was blowing. But then you kind of just go into overdrive, and you know what you've been practicing and training. But uh, you know, Joe's massive on all that kind of stuff. You know, your body language, how you know, do you look tired? Are you showing the opposition you're tired, or are you showing them that you you know you're ready to go again and you're in their faces and you're and you're energized? And it's just second nature to Ireland now. So you saw that in those last 41 phases. The rest of the performance then, so the previous 80 minutes before the 41 phases, like Ireland took a very physical approach to the game. There didn't seem to be a huge amount of creativity. Maybe we maybe it was all the conditions maybe we got a little bit carried away with what we saw at times against South Africa in November what do you put the first 80 minutes down to Andy? Uh, <clears throat> I think there's an element in our game where um, and it's well documented Joe's attention to detail is you know it's borderline obsessive and the players are aware that when the camera when the video session comes in on Monday and he zeroes in on a guy who didn't hit a rook with the right technique or from the right angle it's going to be called out so your attention to detail is is huge in terms of how you um, execute what Joe wants if you were to break that first 80 minutes of, of attack down or or what's happening in terms of our attacking game I think players can execute that last 41 phases because they're in a situation where they know okay it's a closed small scale and Gordon Darcy alluded to it in the Irish Times and said everybody's attention to detail on the minutiae is excellent but if you're to step back and look at the bigger picture and say are we a creative side I don't for whatever reason over the last couple of years Joe's coaching has looked like it's slightly overly prescribed and therefore there's a lack of creativity there's a lack of expression in the players Um, and I would genuinely worry about that going into we're in the middle of a World Cup cycle Mm. and we lost to Argentina in the last World Cup I know we we got really he was so chastened by the fact we lost key players in the prior to the Argentina game but the level of creativity Argentina had on that day they blitzed us and they played rugby where they kept the ball off the ground and passed out of the tackle Um, and there's a huge history behind the great attacking sides that they have a similar approach to rugby where they keep the ball off the floor and they pass out of the tackle and this is going back as far as the 70s and Joe's the great attacking sides do you mean the great sides as well? Yeah, the great sides. We've the set, and a but, lot but that, I mean, is, like, is there another way of winning aside from being a great well, attacking yeah, side? Absolutely, there is, and we're doing it at the moment. But I think. But does I, it only get you so far? Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, well, I, I don't think, think we're going to get into a semis of a World Cup playing like this. Yeah. I think Schmidt, I think Schmidt is providing us frameworks. Yeah, you know, and he's providing us with, uh, like you saw in that game, you saw the Rob Carney inside line. Do you know where he comes from? Full, like probably from the full, but from the from the blind side and comes around and they do this prescribed move and it goes back inside to 15 and we've seen Rob Carney score against Claremont for Leinster, he scored that try straight down there, but that's one of their just prescribed moves for breaking the gain line and modern rugby now is about breaking the gain line, finding the gain line, Ireland found it difficult to break gain lines uh, against the French, the weather was a big issue the physicality um, but one or two, like Ireland did find gain lines, like for their penalties they were, the, every point that they, they got in that match was hard fought and to be fair, the likes of Ahamahina probably should have been sin for mm. some of the stuff mm. that he did Jeez, he was looking um, still, was yeah. right. that would have been a massive difference if yeah. suddenly he had gone off, there would be a lot more space yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they, they did some really good stuff I thought to break the game <coughs> and find holes and then suddenly get wit and then we could see them express themselves a little bit better uh, but in a day like that I think in Paris I think Joe would be kind of going look you know we had to muscle in deep and, and, mm. and do those one off play like you know 80% more 90% one off plays but then we do have that framework to uh, do something just to create a little bit of space to allow guys to flourish now you could say oh well if you had Zebo, he could do it but what, I watched Hog in Scotland against Wales and all Hogg did and Hogg has got more talent than 
you know, than than is necessary at international level. I think, but he he ch he constantly chipping over, mm. trying to return, give the ball back to Wales. Mm. Wales, thank you for the opportunity. W like France, uh, Scotland were playing this overly open, loose game, and it cost them. Mm. You know, and they'll have to tighten up. Ireland are an incredibly difficult team to beat. Uh, they have the ability to beat to beat players and get around conditions obviously dictate but still in those conditions France France were nowhere near scoring a try but for uh, a, a poor a poor green wall in the in in the last five minutes of that match so I think they're going to in very much the right direction I, I totally agree with Dunham like we, we expect more from Ireland's attack and you know the Ireland camp yesterday is coming out that they need to improve in that area but I think when you factor in as Mal said the conditions the fact that Nigel Owens wasn't reffing the breakdown they were tackling flopping over the ball and they were getting away with it um, you know, it was very hard to break. And France defended so well as well. I think they they, they, they equaled the record of number of tackles, 253 tackles. Ireland had 70% of the, you know, had the ball for 70% of the game. Um, so, you know, fr fr I think Gerardo made 31 tackles, which equals Chartres' record again against England. So Ireland starved teams of the ball, but, you know, we definitely have to be a bit better when we have the ball you you weren't a centre or a flying winger and people weren't always looking for you to create but when you were in that Joe Schmidt camp yeah, yeah. Like, did it ever come into your head during a match of I better not take this risk because this will come back to haunt me on Monday well like I didn't really take many risks because I, I just had to catch the ball for starters <laughs> so I used to struggle a bit with that but um <laughs> Yeah no um, yeah no you yeah I to, to be honest I was you know Bundy Aki came in for the autumn internationals and I was you know hugely excited I thought he was brilliant in defence thought he was brilliant in defence there against France but you know he's the kind of guy I'm expecting to take our attack a bit a bit further you know what you see with Connor of him getting his hands free drawing in two or three defenders and getting the offload mm. I think that's something that's going to grow as the Six Nations continues and the, the conditions you know a bit drier than they were in France I think I think Bundy will add a you know completely different element so he's almost at the moment still in that phase of trying to make sure he earns Joe's trust that Joe knows he can do yeah, the basics I, that he won't make any mistakes and then as he grows yeah, in confidence well, we'll see maybe a bit more of what we see from him yeah, I, I mean I don't think I don't think Joe says you, you can't offload but it's you know it's you know, do, do a good offload, otherwise you're in trouble. You know, it's uh, yeah, no 50-50. It it's hard to find a, a soft shoulder there. Uh, I'd agree about the France situation, okay, because the conditions weren't great. But as a, as a general pattern in our attack, mm. we um, we're very difficult. Well, we're very difficult to beat because we're mm. very organised, um, and we haven't lost when we've lost in recent years under Joe. It's been by very little, but I think. My concern, and if you if you're looking at the overall attack, um, is we when it comes down to a crunch game in a World Cup, are we going to be creative enough to get into a, a semi final? And there's nothing to suggest anything has developed or evolved in our attacking game since our previous World Cup exit. But you haven't seen that. Not, not in our November. attack. Not in our attack. In in the. But would in, you think England are more, more creative than Ireland? Uh, yeah, I w I think we're probably one of the least creative sides at the moment. I think there's. Um, I'm not sure if it's just a short term approach to winning each game in the Six Nations and I've heard numerous suggestions before that Joe is under a lot of pressure to simply just to win the Six Nations games because of what it does for revenue and how it drives the game at all levels in Ireland Ooh, that he has to he has to win and win at all costs in those games but if you were to look at what Argentina did before the last World Cup they spent three to four years completely trying to develop this attacking game that New Zealand have done with success in the past, Australia, Wales in the 70s, the French sides of the 80s under Pierre Villepre and these, these guys, they, they allow a development in that attacking game where it's flawed at the start and Argentina lost 78-12 to South Africa about 18 months before their last World Cup and in their last World Cup warm-up they beat South Africa in Durban they went to the World Cup that November and when under pressure they could execute this offloading game and score four or five brilliant tries against Ireland we're not going to be able to do that because we're not practicing it yeah. we're not going to throw a, we're not going to throw a game we're going to lose or sacrifice a game or two I mean we could do it with transparency and say we're trying to develop our attacking game mm. and everyone would probably go yeah. fine it's a good thing to do like that are the Leinster uh, new Leinster where the New Zealander low low yeah like he is you just come he, he attacks the line and is automatically looking for that offload yeah uh, and he's prepared to take the risk to, to drop it and make and he's a very exciting player and yeah 
how many of those how many of those chances uh, have have been different? And then on occasions, then you've got to take like the mistakes. Like there was yeah. with Philippe when Philippe, Philippe uh, yeah. played with us. There was games he won for us, mm. and then there was games he lost for us. Mm. You know, so there is there is that balancing act that you have to be able to. If you if you have these creative players, the reason they're creative is they're taking higher risks yeah. and higher chances, mm-hmm. and the risk with that, of course, is that it doesn't come off, mm-hmm. and that you know you're. And like I've played, I played in Paris a few times, and we've had these, we've taken risks, and we've been three points down after twenty minutes. Yeah, and we're gonna go like, all right. Well, maybe we should tighten up a bit, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, and they're going Jouet, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. you know. So, like, they're, they're, you've got to temper, you know, the situation and the conditions mm. and who you're playing against and what you want out of it, you know. Uh, let's let's be in the last twenty minutes. Let's be in this match in the last twenty minutes. Yeah, well, that's the real. Key. I think that's completely valid. But like, would you say? <laughs> would you say going into the Italy game at home? There's an opportunity. They are going to rip. They're going to rip it. But are we going to play a different type no, of game? Turn around as well. They're going to rip it right? to pieces because they're going to get soft shoulders and they're going to get offloads. I mean, it's, I mean, it's but the, the philosophy you're talking about, like <coughs> what teams in the northern hemisphere during a Six Nations are? I just wonder with Argentina, mm. they can go away and sort of disappear, and they play the yeah. November and summer tests, <coughs> and maybe they're not returning home to the same intense pressure as Joe Schmidt would Absolutely. if during a Six Nations he decided, you know what. Andy's dead right. We need to look back historically on all these great attacking <laughs> well, teams. He's definitely going to do that. Just yeah. on that, though, I think going forward into the, the next World Cup, so we, we mentioned the last World Cup there, so we beat France, then we played Argentina, and we lost key person. We lost Paul mm. O'Connell, Pete Omani, Sean O'Brien, Sexto, Tommy yeah. Bowe got injured early, Jared Payne was missing. So I think we've identified that the, mm. the talent pool we're picking from needs to be deeper. And what about the guy who came in for Paul O'Connell at the last Oh, yeah, football? well, I, I got called out for a week, didn't play a game, and then so I was on <laughs> holiday for a week. But, uh, yeah, um, but you know, at least the summer tour, we've we've really built the strength and depth. Uh, Autumn Internationals, we've built the strength and depth. You see all the guys coming through now. So, you know, that's uh, the attacking game doesn't need to come on, but at least, you know, we're going into the next World Cup with a, a you know, really. Uh, real depth there in, in each and every position. Is that what Scotland are doing at the moment? What you're talking about? I, I like think it is. I think Scotland are are prepared to sacrifice a couple of awful performances with a view to at whatever yeah. the pitch they need to reach at international level is different to what Gregor Townsend did in Zebra away for Glasgow. It's clearly a different requirement in terms of intensity levels. But I I would not be surprised whatsoever if he sat down with the Scottish Rugby Union and said, if you want Glasgow or Scotland to play like Glasgow and give us a real opportunity at getting to the end stages of a World Cup, we need to give it a go under pressure in a Six Nations game. So they've actually learned a huge amount from that Wales game. The players are in training, they're working with Gregor Townsend, they're thinking, well, we've done this with Glasgow, this all works, and suddenly they're at a different level. Yeah, well, they and there's a quick realisation, pick your moments. I think there is. They gave Australia a good solid beat in a few months back mm. playing that style of rugby. So they know they can do it. Six Nations is probably, again, uh, a bit more of a step up than the Autumn Internationals, and they got found out in the likes of Hogg, and ran up his own backside a bit and that's going to happen in that style of play I wouldn't like to be in the Scotland camp this week as uh, old coach myself and Dunnies have Dan McFarland he's uh, he's their forwards coach and he's a bit of a Michael Checker figure so all right, yeah, yeah. so I'd say uh, it's a pretty unpleasant place to be there this week for, yeah. for Scotland that, that, that uh, attacking play and creativity like, is, that a, is that a whole team philosophy or should we be focusing because it seems certainly on the few occasions Ireland got into the French 22 that everything was focused on Sexton that there was nobody really standing up like do we need to be expecting more from Bundiaki are we getting enough are we seeing the best out of Robbie Henshaw Robbie was very quiet mm-hmm. yeah, and I, I just don't think the ball could get to him because the French were coming up so hard uh, we didn't see much of Henshaw and I, I would see a lot more of him um, mm-hmm. Because but is he the prime the example though of, of what you're talking about, Andy? That yeah. like he does have that talent. We know, yeah. Yeah. and we've heard. Uh, I think we're not as creative. This. We're definitely not as creative in the centre as we used to be. Like we we, we had obviously with Darius and Drico and these guys yeah. back in the day. Like my God, we had we we had so much uh, uh, creativity. And it's you know lots lo- of there, ring rolls, ring rolls. Yeah. Joey Carbrian, well. Joey Carbrian, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, two I, kind of fly halves. Yeah, I think that would change the construct. But like the likes of Darius and Draco, who were obviously legends, they had a bit of license, 
and, I, yeah. and it's licensed to thrill absolutely yeah. but they did and I think yeah. you and they you, learned on the job as well like you, you uh, earned that. used to make a few mistakes as absolutely. well you know back in the day you know before he was complete yeah I think you earned the license to thrill as Mike nicely put yeah. it as a player by taking a risk sometimes going outside th- there's no coach in the history of rugby or any sport is going to criticise a guy who goes off script and succeeds mm. he's going to go well done but if you go off script and don't succeed there's plenty of coaches yeah. will but, uh, like rip you to shreds and I think that's the balancing yeah. act yeah. but like the, I don't underestimate those conditions in fact like they, when sometimes it's better not to have the ball in those conditions mm-hmm. because you can ramp up the line speed you get in, in the attacker's faces they, they, you've got like a split split second to make a decision and it's very hard to get the ball out to the width unless you're doing those pinpoint uh, Kick passes, which Sexto did. So let's, I, I'd say, judge judge him on the next few games with, in better yeah. conditions. We're tight enough on time, but it would be very remiss with uh, two great second rows here not to talk about the impact of James Ryan on his first Six Nation start. Mike, you taught him everything he knows. Oh yeah, well, I, well, I taught him how to sack moles, and that's about it. But um, <laughs> yeah, so me, me and Mal were talking, myself and Mal were talking about him early. He's, uh, you know, he's Mal's height, six foot eight. Uh, I, we were both injured last season, so he was in. We were in injured gym, and uh, you know, he had to. He had the big frame, had to bulk up a bit, so he put a lot of size and mass on. What did he mention? Uh, he mentioned not as much as me now, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, um, more than Dev. Dev just benched at sixty, but uh, yeah, no, he's a, he's a phenomenal specimen. He. Under 20s World Cup, he showed his leadership qualities, leading them to second place, beating the All Blacks, and then, as we said earlier, getting capped before. You know, I think Drico was the only one to get capped before playing for Leinster, um, and then started all six of uh, Leinster's Champions mm-hmm. Cup games. Two awesome performances against Montpellier, which is probably what got him picked to start against France. Um, but uh, I mean, and, and, and I was saying again earlier, you know, he he really led from the front. You know, a 21 year old, I think he had 17 carries, defended really well. Um, good in the line out so I mean it was a dream debut for him the, the French papers were talking himself and Sexton up as the, you know, the, the best players on the park Has the role massively changed since you started out like talking about 15, 16, 17 carries from, from a second row yeah, Oh yeah and it's only a certain type of second row can do that like he, to be, he, had, he was able to find those soft shoulders and he, he knew the lines and a lot of a lot of lines he was running were, were ones that you know aren't easy lines to just you don't just run like guys run deeper and they'll just take up a ball he he had the real uh, nous just to be able to run some of those lines and find find the find the gain line uh, he was it was phenomenal obviously great in the lineup but also great in defence in the lineup because he is he's obviously uh, very very tall very strong but he's obviously quite light as well because yes. they can throw him up you know and, and maybe Explosive, they, yeah. for Dev is, Dev is like you know, just by being six foot eleven, he's a heavy guy. You know, so that's some a little bit extra that he can bring to it. It seems though, Ian Henderson as well is it's far more comfortable now in the second row, maybe even yeah. than he was during the World Cup, where I think there was concerns that you might because it's such a and he, a grueling he position. He was losing definitely something get better the pitch. as well because he, as he, uh, we, we spoke a little bit earlier about he doesn't get that much game time at second row, and it takes a while. The fact that you're just scrummaging the whole time as well, it takes more out of legs, you're in, in, in a bit tighter in the malls or what have you. It, it is a, a bit more grueling on the legs and, and you've got to, it's hard to get the ball in your hands, especially the six you're used to having the ball. There's a second row where it, you've, got to, you've got to readjust yourself and you know, I think he'll get better and better and better as the as the. I, th- as the I, th- goes I think on. with he- I think with Hendy as well, he's he's pretty much got the complete second row game. He's a good carrier, hits rooks hard. He's very physical, good in the lineup. But the thing for me, which really impressed me, the last game of the Autumn Internationals against Argentina, uh, I think we identified with Pauli retiring, Donica Ryan going to Racing, that we need backup at lineout calling. So I think Dev got a rest that Argentina game. Hendy called the lineouts and he did. He called them really well and. You know, it was another opportunity from against France. He he, he called the line out again. So, you know, it's good to have that backup of because Dev, you know, Dev's been very good for us week in week out. But we have to have backup if Dev isn't there for someone who can call the line outs. Is every second row with a certain amount of experience able to call a line out, or is there a speci- is there a real talent behind it? No, there is a real talent ar- around it, and you know, it's it's a hell of a lot extra work in camp because instead of concentrating on your own game you're concentrating on you know the team game so it's very it's a very un, you know Mal you, you used to call a, a fair bit so I, I wasn't yeah. I wasn't a great caller so I'll let yeah. you answer that one after after I managed to wrangle it off Shane Byrne it took a while but uh, <laughs> he's a tricky individual yeah um, 
But yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to it. Yeah, you've got you've got to know the line out inside out, um, and you're gauging a lot of it. You're gauging it on, um, you know, what the opposition is doing, um, and a lot of times you've only got one or two chances because suddenly you make a first mistake, then it gives the opposition a chance, and and the pressure mounts to to make the right call, you know. But I think nowadays it's more uh, the line out has like I don't know what Leo brought in the, these kind of little these little. Um, uh, smaller kind of calling systems, so that you actually go in there with a, you go in there with three or four calls and that's it. Uh, but you've got a number of these systems that you can switch to, you know. So um, uh, yeah, I think it's easier now to to manage it, you know. Um, but it does take time, and you've got to know the line out inside out. And as you say, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of your of your head time yeah. as well. And it, which you 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 normally be preparing, trying to make sure that everything else is right. You're, you're not focusing, just worrying about your own game. You're focusing on the calls now. And what, if they do this, we do this. You know, so um, spending hours you, looking at footage of previous games, you know, what's up, free, yeah, what's yeah. available on the laptops late do. late at night, looking looking at previous yeah. games. Uh, we're going to go to the Aviva Stadium in a moment to chat with Kevin McLaughlin ahead of the game. I think everyone expects Ireland to beat Italy, but on the basis of what we've seen so far, are you more confident or less confident of Ireland winning the championship than you were a week ago? Oh, definitely more confident because they've gone one step, you know, and it's a massive step. Um, to win away in France it's the fourth time in our history doing it so um, people may talk about performance but the result is all that mattered um, so they'll step on to the next stage um, and the next three steps are, are, are definitely manageable Andy would you be concerned that unless the attacking plan evolves somewhat between now and Twickenham I, I think we've made ourselves even more difficult to beat which is quite an achievement because we're an exceptionally hard team to beat We're Jose Mourinho's Manchester United I would say it's even quite a good parallel that. I think even it's quite a good parallel that. we're we're kind yeah. of a wind machines at the moment but we're not doing it with any great style Mike Hashtag road to rugby Yes <laughs> <laughs> Yes He's always on brand. Get yeah, the website in, Andy. Why not? Free plugs all around today. Uh, lads, thanks a million for coming into studio. Enjoy the game. Uh, we've had Mallow Kelly, Andy Dunn and Mike McCarthy. And as Mike said, Volkswagen.ie forward slash rugby. Uh, check out everything around the home games with their Road to Rugby campaign. Hashtag Road to Rugby.